let me give it to you straight. Algorithms have pretty much dominated our world for the past decade and a half or, two or more. But it's interesting to see how they're developing and the rate at which they're developing. DALI and DALI 2 and Midjourney have really exploded onto the scene in the past year. And um, the implications of the uses are as diverse and complex as they are challenging. This is a conversation with Hassan Raghab. He's a computational designer with a background in architecture and uh, also a conceptual artist focusing on uh, the visual relationship between art and architecture. Hassan, welcome to the Over the Horizon podcast. Hi, Rodin. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here, man. All right. So I think one of the main issues that you, or one of the main concerns um, that we need to deal with when it comes to AI tools like this is the challenge of um, bias in the data sets and what they mean for the end product that you get what it means for the evolution of these tools, um, these AI-driven tools. Um, you've had some experience uh, with this. Um, can you talk a bit about, about uh, what, what you've experienced and how you've seen it change over time? So yeah, I, I remember after like uh, only like a week of me trying my journey, uh, I remember I saw a post on Instagram and there was this guy who was trying to understand um, how different languages will affect uh, the AI. So I, at that point, I didn't know that Midjourney actually uh, takes, like accepts other languages than English. So, okay. so yeah, and in his comparison, he was trying to uh, see it, like how language can actually, languages has a lot of culture in it, in a way sure. that's different from like just putting the same thing in like in English, for example. And um and and in his comparison, he was trying to, uh, or like his outcomes or like his uh, his results is actually was actually showing that if you put something in English, and in the same time you put it in the same other language, just like Japanese or Chinese, you mm -hmm. get completely different results, and it will really reflect how culture plays out in that mm. uh, in the essence of the AI. So I thought that was really interesting. So I now you're to... Egyptian. You've yeah, grown I'm up Egyptian. in Alexandria. Uh -huh. Yep, correct. Yeah, and. Yeah. So I would imagine the environment in which you grew up with the impressions that you had as a child and growing up would greatly influence your design process and your creativity. Yeah, how, exactly. how does that transfer into um, your experience with these AI tools? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's kind of was like when I saw that post, I thought like, hey, that's yeah, that makes sense. I should try to like use like Arabic or like use like Egyptian cities, for example. So when mm -hmm. I first tried like to use Arabic, I was really disappointed because like, it didn't really get me the results that I really wanted. It was far away from anything that I was typing. It was just ridiculous. Okay, and, let me uh, let me pull up uh, let me pull up your uh, Instagram page here. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Um, and talk us through um, this experience or this journey of yours of dealing uh, with bias. And I think this is Skyro sketches. But this right. is Alexandria, actually. This city is a okay, tram. This is, this is about Alexandria, yeah. So right. yeah, yeah. So this is actually my first encounter of like culture uh, and AI that mm. I was trying to cut in to see how the uh, how the bot and AI like understands um, Alexandria or understands Egypt in a way. So I, I I just started with like very basic prompts, like say like just typing Alexandria and see how it will work, and it just didn't give me anything. So I just kept pushing so, it and pushing it. Hang on. So help, help us understand those prompts. Help us understand your, your creative process while mm -hmm. using the AI tool. So yeah. Um, so the way that these uh, tools work is that you just like input a text. And mm -hmm. just uh, this text is not a code. It's just a description, textual uh, description. It's just words. Yeah. Yeah, it's just words. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the better you describe the words to the AI, the better results mm -hmm. that you'll get. The more ambiguous you are with the results, the more crazier the uh, the outputs or the results. Um, so, what was it about Alexandria that you were trying to capture and bring and carry over the influence of? It was actually I was just in the beginning. I was just really trying to get uh, how the AI understands Alexandria in any sense. For example, it's really if you just put like Sagrada Familia, which is like a very famous building in Spain, you'll just get a very visual uh identity out 
out of it. You can't really see an image that really represents the Sagrada Familia from various angles. Like mm. you can really, the data set has a lot of like Sagrada Familias or has a lot of the works of Zahadid, for example, or like a lot of images of Paris, of Los Angeles, of like many mm. Western cities. But at that point, it didn't really have enough representation of at least Alexandria or like Egyptian cities or like pharaonic temples. So and so and so the AI didn't understand your prompt or didn't have enough of training data. Exactly, it for, just like to, created them very poorly. Points. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So right. so I was kind of trying really. I was working in parallels on like many different explorations. One of them is like Alexandria, and I was really disappointed because I can get really beautiful results very easily if I was to uh, use uh, European uh, styles, like European architectural styles or like Western styles. But like if you're using um, what I call unpopular styles, which is like, <laughs> like you know, like Egyptian architecture, for example, you yeah. would really get very sketchy results. Uh, so I've, uh, so I took that as a challenge actually. And I spent like the, the next three weeks trying to really train the model or trying to really get something out of it that kind of represents alexandria and mm -hmm. the process in the i mean what started as a challenge kind of um, turned into some artistic vision in the middle in the middle like very mm -hmm. personal project you know the more i created um, prompts for alexandria the more i felt like i can relate to this more so i can mm -hmm. input something else and uh, i can put something personal into it and uh, and yeah, eventually so, that's. I guess this would this would have been the case for not just for Egyptian um, and Islamic art and architecture and cr uh, creative influences, but I would imagine to begin with the data set that these AI's models would be trained on would be kind of overwhelmingly biased towards Western, Western. art and architecture, and not so much Eastern art or South Asian art or. All of that and that that is that has serious implications for creativity for the process of creativity for bias and how do you go about ensuring that um, there is equitable representation in the process of creation of art and using these tools like um, dali oh. midjourney in your case yeah so I mean, for me personally, I try to be very uh, open about it. I try to speak about it a lot and uh, try to, uh, I don't know, inspire people or like tell, ask people to use, um, not to use like many Western uh, architectural styles. You can use whatever you want, of course. But again, like uh, I think if we have enough users that uh, are from not like non-Western countries, like mm -hmm. who, who can use their own culture or their own identities in their work. I think that will kind of influence the AI. So you need to game the system. Yeah, I think so. But again, there's another part to it because it's again, it's point. You can have all the users in the world trying to recreate something, uh, but if it's not in the data set, it just won't create it or just won't create it as good. And uh, I think this was kind of downside in the beginning of the of these tools. Like their data set is kind of limited, and I think they are trying to expand that to have more uh, ex inclusive data sets that has more artistic styles or like unpopular again or like non-Western. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we can see that, um, like for example, in Mid Journey, they just released yesterday. yesterday they just released uh, the uh, uh, version four of their model. And mm -hmm. it looks like this this model has more um, it, it the data set of this model is more inclusive. Uh, so I got better results like immediately using. Uh, yeah, let me. Like, and this is what you're talking about, right? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's the one. Okay. So so I mean, this like my ver my very first impression about like uh, this model is that hey, okay, now I can see this the Islamic details better. I couldn't have done so. Uh, in mm -hmm. the past, not not with these like fine details, like that really kind of sets uh, like the Islamic or the Gothic or like the uh, the Persian architecture like apart from modern modern architecture, for example. I it's think it's process. getting better, yeah, and mm -hmm. I think it's not perfect for all the styles in a way. Uh, just like to be fair, um, like the limitation in the data set, it's something I think that everybody's kind of trying to work on. I actually had my uh, worries in the beginning, like like in the past two months, uh, I started to kind of a little bit 
changed my mind because I I kept hearing uh, the developers talking about how important it is for them to have more inclusive data sets. Uh, it's really helping them, um, you know, build their models to have like just like to have a better models. And uh, I think that's again that's not I'm I'm only speaking about uh, ancient Egyptian arch or like the Egyptian architecture just because like I'm Egyptian that's kind of my work. But uh, I think it's the same for like for example like I tried uh, some. I have some tribes with some Indian architecture as well, and it just didn't go well. It, I had the same issues like that I had with the uh, Egyptian architecture, and uh, I, I hope it gets sold. Like, um, what's the solution? Is it does the solution lie in getting more and more um, people, uh, more and more creative artists like you, and a, a much broader diversity of artists to use these tools? Or does it um, does the solution lie also perhaps forcing a sufficient number of prompts to get the data set to evolve? I think we should begin by like having like a global awareness of the issue itself. Like mm. so, the developers should know about it, the users should know about it, everyone should know about it, mm. uh, and then yeah, th there will be two parts of the equation here, right? You need like enough users to like start like using th these prompts, just mm. like to to. Because again, this like like for Midjourney, for example, there's a feedback between the users and the developers. You create like your prompts, uh, and then you rate your images, and then the developers will use like your prompts and your um, and your ratings to kind of actually train the model in a in a better way. So it it goes both ways. Like the the users need to kind of work on their prompts, and the developers need to have more uh, inclusive data sets and actually to train the model on those data sets. Hmm. I came across this. Uh, can you talk about this and the influences that you were captain? Because this looks like influences of Roman architecture, and it seems to have done a much better job of of capturing the essence of what you were trying to create. Yeah. So yeah, I think it. it I think here it just like kind of uh, it was able to kind of capture the vibe that I was trying to achieve because it was much more abstract. So I was really trying to create this like so like very outworldly uh, concept. This is actually started as a conceptual, like this was like a conceptual form finding for a project that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the project I'm working on is much more detailed. It's not like that at all. But um, I was just trying to, uh, while I'm using Midjourney, I'm always trying to find the new visual language for architecture, or like forms and shapes. And uh, the mix between heritage and you know new concepts uh, whether in math or in arts or whatever it's just like creates like this really interesting results and like creates yeah. like this really nice vibes but you know hassan i can't help but notice that these seem to be a lot more granular and a lot more detailed than yeah. your experiments with um, Egyptian or Islamic influences in your creations. Uh -huh, yeah, Th because this is actually an older model of Midjourney. So, like this is like the V3 model. So the V3 mm -hmm. model like is really good with creating like these very detailed, very uh, grainy, very noisy um, images. Mm -hmm. But it just like it's very creative. The new the new uh, versions like the test uh, in Midjourney or the uh, the v4 they are more tuned over photorealism so there's always this paddle in mid-journey between if you want to create something that looks like really crazy or something that looks really photorealistic hmm. so y you can actually i mean for me i can immediately say like this is a mid-journey image and and it was made by which model if that makes sense it's hmm. like yeah yeah yeah, so yeah. how do you rate the evolution of of um, of Midjourney uh, as mm -hmm. a tool in your in your toolbox in your creative toolbox? It's it's really hard to say. Um, I mean, Midjourney, like I think like the developers like David. What's Holt, like, okay? Developer. What's the value add? What's the value add to your uh, creative design process? You mean the added value to? Uh, yeah. The how does it help you uh, as a creative designer in in trying to conceptualize? Or trying to bring forth what you conceptualize in your mind, or what you think of. Yeah. So yeah, the, this AI tool is just like um, it has an unshift, uh, an unprecedented shift in how we think about creativity, in my opinion. And um, I mean, for me, it's really changing everything that I've thought of uh, about like the creative process. For me, the creative process was always 
has some linearity to it. As a computational designer, I always, I've always tried to break down uh, the forms and shapes uh, into their basics. Like I always thought about forms in the sense of like a point or a line or a plane, you mm. know, and then they will transform into complex shapes. But I can always track down or like trace my ideas down to these very basic principles. Now I actually don't think about like the basic ideas in the in the sense of like the point or the line. It's actually mm -hmm. the entire the entire abstract idea, you know. So it's uh, a more holistic approach that you take uh, with this tool to the creative process, is it? Visual, uh, hol visually. I mean, visually, not mm. like not in the sense of the form finding, of course, but visually, yeah. yeah it's just it's it's shifting everything. It's uh, mm. I actually I mean the way I imagine things in my mind right now is actually different. Like right now. Well, that's really interesting. D yeah. Help us understand that. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So How's yeah, for it example, you? like right now, I mean, before that, before using the AI tools, when I thought about an idea, I always, again, I was always trying to break it down to like its basic forms and try to to see how I can achieve that physically. But with Midjourney or like with the with these AI tools, I always think about, I start I stop thinking about like their basics. I just like the the image will just pop up in my head and mm -hmm. it will just transform into another very unrelated idea instantly you know it's okay. just like i don't know it's it's just like um i feel like the ai like looking too much at the ai tools kind of just shifted the way that i'm imagining things so i can actually now imagine like 100 concepts in less than a minute these 100 concepts actually yeah I, I don't know if i can achieve them but i can i just i can see them in my mind you know what i mean and i mm. just like and they keep iterating and they never stop and this is something so, that never happened before. Okay, so you're saying the 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 creative uh, iterative process is a value addition to your design thinking process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it it just pushed the ima my imagination personally. I think it's pushing everybody's imagination beyond the limit that we could have never achieved, or maybe we could have achieved like in years. Because again, uh, like yeah, I mean, for example, right now I've been working with Midjourney for about four months, or like mm -hmm. I think four months, maybe five. And uh, I've created about 23,000 images using Midjourney. That's much more than I what I've created in my entire life. Like, you know, if yeah. if I worked without AI. And uh, actually, like, seeing all these images, whether it, if it's mine, I, I must have looked over, like, a million images during the past few months. And this, like, this is all, like, a new visual library to my brain. That mm. That's something that, that I never had before. But... Uh, I can't help but but wonder if this is this in the long run. Um, I mean, an AI tool as powerful as this, uh, and we're talking about Mid Journey, Dali, Dali Two, uh, Stable Diffusion. These are still early days yet for these potentially phenomenally powerful tools, right? These are early days. But listening to you, I can't can't help but wonder if these eventually become crutches for the human intellect and the creative process and then what happens to uh, individual creativity, um, individual ability, does it kind of level the playing field or does it raise the bar for everybody and everybody starts off at a much higher uh, creative level? Yeah, but again, what does individuality really mean like, to begin with in the arts, right? Um... I mean, it's it's a tough question. Um, but I, I mean, imagine so much so much of what you imbibe or what you absorb from your environment as you grow, the influences. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. for example, growing up in Alexandria and your experiments with uh, Egyptian and Islamic architecture and art and influences yeah. like that, and bringing that into your creative process, that would set you apart or from someone, let's say, in who's grown up in California or... Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, looking at that, everybody has a different experience, definitely. But again, yeah. how you employ or how you use that experience is what sets you as an individual artist in that sense, right? Uh, I can't see that any different from using the AI. I mean, it's, it's. I think it will have its pros and cons in a way. Like, if you're talking about the cons, it's just like, because it's a very democratizing tool, and it's very... It, it's really accessible to anybody and it's really easy to use that will make uh what appears to be a more uniform or like a more uh universal style 
that we can really see right now. There's a, mm -hmm. some kind of a universal style where you can actually go and see like images from a journey and you will know the tool, but you wouldn't know the artist, if that makes sense. And uh, this is, is actually- Is that a good thing? Uh, it's not a good thing, but again, I think <laughs> it's a collateral. It, it's something that was bound to happen. But again, it's the same thing that's happening with like reels on Instagram or with like you know more or like with digital art even like 3d modeling or whatever it's just like a it's just like a byproduct of the uh of a new technology that's kind of emerging uh to the masses or emerging in the markets but again i mean that's the bad side of it but the good side is i think as an artist you can find a way to employ that into your into your benefits like you can really because this is again this is a very powerful tool and uh we need tools. I mean, we are humans. We are just as good as our tools, right? Like the the, fo the phone that you're using is just an extension to yourself. The yeah. laptop that we're using, like the software that you're using is an ex extension for the architect. And now these tools, True. again, these are just like the extension of the artist. And uh, you can use them however you want to use them. And of course, there will be some, like, you know, some downside, just like, you know, the usage of social media. Like there's a lot of downsides in the usage of social media. So it, I can I can see like how this is any different in a way. I, I mean, we will have our cons, but again, it's a it's a new technology. It was bound to happen. Uh, there's no stopping it in a way. So, like, yeah, we always we all need to yeah, address like as, the cons, but uh... I, yeah, you're right. It seems like there's no turning back. Um, mm -hmm. And whether you like it or not, um, these tools are here to stay, and they will influence the design and creative process um, in an in increasingly influential manner. But I just, you know, um, talk us through this. This I came across this uh, creation of yours, uh -huh. and it's really interesting. Help us understand what this is. What were you trying to achieve here? Because this looks fascinating. Yeah, so this is yeah. So this is like one of my very first tries using Stable 2 Fusion, uh, the notebook, the collab notebook, uh, the form. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so mainly like this notebook, uh, the main use, why I use this notebook is because it's ability to create animation. That's something that I can do in mid-journey or DALI, at least alone. And uh, here, what I was really trying to do is to try to make a very short video that's kind of encapsulates the entire history, not the entire history, but at least some history, or like the development of the Egyptian architecture uh, through the years from like the pharaonic age, uh, until like somehow like today or like the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the way that uh, uh, that uh, Stable Diffusion works, or like this notebook works, is that you you put various inputs. You ju just don't put one input. You, you just put various inputs and you put like uh, time frames to which it w of when you, you want this input to you when you want the, this uh, this prompt to start uh, at what point of your video. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I was and then just you said keyframes. To... Yeah, it's like keyframes. Yeah, exactly. Mm, mm. <laughs> so, for example, like this video is about 800 keyframes, and it's subdivided over um, eight, I think, uh, eight prompts. So each after each hundred frames, you start a new prompt, and um, I guess, and uh, yeah, it was kind of a way to try to interpolate um, uh, the different styles of the Egyptian architecture uh, in a way. And uh, I was really interested because you can see like some very interesting results uh, through this interpolation, like the mix between the, um, like, you know, the Islamic architecture and then the Ortavu in a way, or like the Coptic architecture and the Islamic architecture. It's, uh, right. It's really And how, how satisfied were you with the end product, with the end result? Was it, how close was it to your, to what you had in your head, in your mind while thinking about it? Yeah. Yeah, well, that that's the thing about using AI. You can't really uh, measure the success based on how you achieved what you had in your mind. It's I think for me, I try to um, to evaluate my success by by how the output was really developed from my initial idea. Does that make sense? I think the main usage of the AI tools is not to create what we want to create. Yeah, if you want to create something that's really in your mind, AI, the AI is not like the tool for you. you you'd be better off to try to uh, work on another software uh, to model what you're really thinking about. What you're really thinking about. It, these AI tools doesn't understand the ideas or like doesn't understand commands in the same way that the usual software does. And um, mm. for me, when I use the AI tools, I'm just trying to really 
push my idea forward. So I just like to start with a simple prompt and then strike building on it. And uh, it's like a feedback, you know, I see the, the so output. How much, and then I so how much of this is dependent on how descriptive you can be in your prompt? It's really, how accurately it's really important. Yeah, yeah, prompt. yeah. Being accurate and descriptive is really important to, uh, to your outputs, basically. The more ambiguous you are with the prompts, uh the more crazier results that you'll get with uh, the uh, with these tools so it's really depending on how accurate you, you want to be or like how how exactly you want your idea to be yeah. how are you using the tool the lines can get blurred and confusing at times because creativity is part of the human condition and okay. part of consciousness um and part of human duality you know us and the other and the how we perceive the world around us what influences we take in from the world around us and it seems it seems to me from the outside that um there's a lot of that process that is being um kind of mirrored by these ai tools yeah, but I think that's the one way to look at it. Like, what defines creativity? I mean, you're kind of trying to let me, define let me, creativity. Let me, let, me, let me qualify that a bit. And let me, let me specify that a bit. I mean, if you, if you take a child um, and the child grows up in one part of the world, uh, the child is exposed. Let's, let's take you, for instance. You grew up in Alexandria. You were, in, you were exposed to influences in your environment, in your ecosystem. And you learned that if you lived all your life there... Um, and didn't travel anywhere. That's that would be your world. That would be the sum of the collection of your impressions and influences, right? Um, and and that is in essence so much like um, an individual data set for for an AI algorithm. You're only as good as your data set, and so uh -huh. that is so similar to the human condition and the human um perception of the world around us and we're only as good as as our context what we're as as context right as what we're exposed to uh -huh. so the similar the similarities are you cannot kind of ignore them They're, and they can be a bit disconcerting yeah yeah i agree with you but again it's kind of different though I, i'm not sure about how accurate the comparison between a child's brain and a computer brain or like how a computer works uh how how is it fair right because we are i mean the human beings are really trying to build artificial intelligence based on human intelligence i believe so wisdom wisdom would dictate that um mid journey dally dally two stable diffusion tools ai tools like this remain um in the human toolbox, in the human creative toolbox, and don't go beyond. Yeah, but again, you never know. I mean, humans humans are not very wise. <laughs> so <are> you <laughs> I, I don't know. I just try to think about it like from different angles because, again, who knows what will happen, right? Yeah. Like, um, it, 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 we, I think we, it, this, it, yeah, we're quite capable of having a mad scientist somewhere just. Do some crazy experiments. Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's super easy. Um, but again, I think it's it's just bound to happen. Again, like we have set ourselves on a course of this course, like mm. from the starting of like inventing uh, agriculture. Like the 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 minute that you started intervening with the environment and trying to change that uh, to solely benefit you as a as a species, y you already are on that course. Everything that we've been doing, we've been doing to try to do our own experiments to become yeah. gods in a way. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's kind of reminds me of what Oppenheimer said after the first. Yeah, exactly. Uh, after new, the bomb. Yeah, yeah said, exactly. Uh, I'm become death, the the destroyer, the of, destroyer of worlds. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, yeah, yeah, I, but... I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a good example. We created the nuclear power. I mean, yeah. it's really easy right now to just we have enough nuclear power to destroy like our planet, like and many that, more. Yeah, many times I mean, over. yeah, exactly. So that's a more existential risk than mm. actually having like a sentient AI. You know what I mean? And um, so yeah, I mean, there's always but a sentient AI could just wake up and say, "Look, humans are the problem." 
let's eradicate them. Yeah, I mean, problem. yeah, uh, you, yeah. Or, or maybe I can use them. You know, if you like, maybe we can. He will use it. I mean, the AI will use us as batteries, just like the Matrix. Or maybe <laughs> for experiments like Questworld. I mean, there's like enough examples that us human can really think about. Yeah. But I think I don't think that the future will be that utopian. I think it will be somewhere you know, in between Utopia and Utopia. Mm. Something that we really... I, something that's really obvious, but we've never really thought of, because as humans, I think we like to go to extremes. Like, we really like to think about, like, the best scenario and the worst case scenario. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I mean, who will know what will happen. <laughs> okay, let's 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 come back to the process of, of design and um, the application of um, mid-journey to your design process. <laughs> how How far are we from AI tools like this, replacing the human architect? And what uh, is the limiting factor, if any? Is it so engineering I... knowledge? Mm -hmm. Is it, um, because it's, it seems that there's so much of knowledge and experience that is part of the human creative design process that comes from not only um, our understanding of the real world, uh, yeah, and the physics of the real world and how that operates, which the AI doesn't have right now. So yeah, I think, I think the question is like, um, I think the point where AI will actually replace the human architect is when that kind of technology kind of be available to the mass usage, like just like Majorni right now, and um, like for example, there's a lot of researchers in the in the academic world who are actually using AI for different parts of the architectural. Um, uh, of the architectural topics, for example, like some people use AI in construction to solve like structural problems. Some people use it for um, uh, plumbing or like electric wiring over uh, PIM models. Um, so um, the thing is, I think right now what's really limiting for uh, creating a, an AI model that's available for the usage of the uh, mass designers or architects is the first step is to create a, an AI that can create a 3D model from text. And right now, to create a 3D model is a very challenging, not because of the technology, but it's just because it's really hard to create a big data set with a lot of high fidelity 3D models. In the real world, we face um, a whole range of, of problems uh, when it comes to housing, when it comes to habitat, uh, when it comes to ecosystems. We seem to be out of sync with the environments and ecosystems in which we live and habit habitate. Um, do you think AI tools and, and an extension of what you were just saying therein could lie the solution? I think it might create a solution. Uh, but again, I, I, I think that you will also find some downsides, right? There, there will be certain ways to kind of capitalize uh, from these tools in a way. Um, I don't know, maybe they will be only available to like a very niche market or they will be super customized, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to be offered to like different uh, social classes or social levels. Like we, we just don't know, right? Because again, this technology and is that, like... That sounds like it's reinforcing bias. Again, it's driven by human. Again, that's, yeah. I mean, I, and like whatever human interest lies, that's how you will use these tools, how these tools will be driven. Uh, it won't drive, I don't think there will be a scenario where you will get a sentient AI and the sentient AI will be so just and he will try to rule by an iron fist to, uh, you know, to like, like, I don't know, like, it's very hard to, to think about like uh, Karl Marx AI <laughs> mentality, <laughs> where it's really trying to, uh, you know, you make like a, a harmonious, like a uniform life. A I can, communist because, AI. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that's, I, I don't think we're, we will reach that point. Maybe, I don't know. But again, it's, um, I think it's driven by the human, uh, you know, intuition in a way. And how we're using that. It's, it's just like, you know, we have autonomous cars right now. Are they, they're not affordable to everybody. Again, there are, I mean, there are categories of the cars and you can only sure. afford like some kind of a technology based on which social class are you in. So mm. why AI will be any different? Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the future. And um, in your experience, mm -hmm. what is it that makes you most hopeful and what it is it what is it that makes you most fearful? 
I'm trying to think if I am actually fearing that technology. I don't think I, I have any fear of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why. I mean, there's a, I mean, if I really thought, think about it, like there's a lot of things that's that's kind of really scary. Uh, I might be out of a job in the next few years, you know. And uh, actually, like right now, like if you think about it, maybe in in two or three years, every student, every architecture student that paid thousands and thousands of dollars in student loans to gain some skills, all the money that they wasted and all that time will be and put in hours and hours and hours yeah, of yeah, rigorous yeah. work. You're just like you're really building your career, like in your twenties, yeah. in a way. So you you actually get a, a big loan that you will have to pay for the rest of your life to get some certain skills to help you get by. You know, mm. in like and in the society, can just do everything. You know, yeah, and it just wasted. So, so that's something that's kind of yeah, exactly. So that's something mm. that's kind of. I mean, it's not scary for me personally. Luckily, I don't have any student loans, <laughs> and like, I mean, and luck, and yeah, I always try to. I don't know. I, it's just not scary. I'm just like really fascinated by this technology at that point. Mm. And uh, but the implications think, for the future of work are 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 immense and deep. Yeah, yeah, I, and that's why I'm trying to understand by using these tools actually. So mainly what i'm using these tools is that i think like i find a great potential uh, in the future usage of these tools in the creative uh industries that i'm actually working in working mm. on right now and um and i think like in the future these tools will extend beyond uh creating only beautiful images it will extend to create like models and after that it will extend to create architectural products or like feasible uh, design prototypes and mm. then on the same time as the technology as the technology um develops in so in so many different areas that's kind of going around architecture and design for example like production or like construction and these hmm. uh, and these kind of um uh, related topics to so architecture uh you will get some a lot of like very very smart models that can really talk to each other and the you and you will be in the middle of the process trying to deal with these different models to kind of get your own um physical product something that's mm. really changing and again because we're entering like a this spiritual age of like you know the metaverse so th again these tools are like um are great uh in working in the virtual reality um in a sense at least now they work better in virtual reality than they work in the physical um or like in 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 the re in the real world so mm. yeah there's like you, whenever you can look at the future, you'll see the AI is there and it's there with a very powerful presence. And um, you just need to understand that. You just need to understand the tool, uh, keep up with like the uh, the development of these tools, know what's going on, and uh, try mm -hmm. to employ them in your process as much as you could. It sounds like the evolution of AI will f force the next step in the evolution of of human species, we will need to evolve in order to keep up. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, that's like uh, if somebody like if somebody was born like in the fifties and they are not using internet and they're not using smartphones anymore, they just can, mm. can't keep up in anything, literally in mm. anything. And um, I, you might have a good chance of like you want to like live an isolated life in some way like you go to the desert or, the, or to the jungle and just you know, live like the basic life and that's okay but again if you want to be part of the society you have to know these tools more or less you have to understand them just like mm. you have to know like internet you have to know like how to use like applications uh, yeah. on your phone yeah yeah but the dawn of the internet age also brought along with it so many problems and that and that have impacted our society in the world we live in in so many different and far-reaching ways just can't help but wonder if this is the same is going to happen with ai you have the good and the bad and you have to take the bad with the good yeah yeah they go hand in hand again the, again this is technology yeah. you can't have nuclear power without creating the nuclear bomb hmm. and it's up to you to how to use it it's yeah it's just like I feel like a lot of people are trying to, are, or they think about AI as a very different concept from every other technology that we created, but it's actually not. It's actually the same. And uh, if you want to really address the impacts or the problems or the downsides that we have to deal with with using AI, you need to really think about the human condition, 
because mm. that's actually what's driving the technology. That's actually what's driving the AI. Like you said it before, like the AI is kind of learning from us, from our context. Yeah. So if you want to like have a good or responsible technology or tool that we need to use, we have to work on ourselves first. I don't think there are there's enough people really thinking about it and talking about it. And that I think that's the biggest problem, that there's not enough discussion about it. it and in terms of, you know, um, from different aspects, I mean, there's a lot of, I think the debate is mostly around social media and the evils on social media, and that has its own um, legitimacy. Mm-hmm. But there's the applications of AI tools are so diverse in so many different aspects of our lives um, that you have to talk about them as well. You can't ignore it. So, yeah, I think I think a lot of people, uh, because, again, because this is a powerful tool, it's impacting a lot of people. So you get a lot of different reactions from different people. Like, there mm. are people who are just, like, trying to deny its existence or, like, hey, this won't work. This, this won't yeah. live long, you know. And... <laughs> And it's just, I mean, I think it's just pointless to talk about it in that way. I mean, if you if you were to try these well, tools and then you... Escapism, put yeah. Escapism exactly. has never helped anybody. You exactly. Know. <laughs> that's, like, that's denial. Absolute denial. Yeah. That's, that's like very, you know, that's um, that's issues. Like, you know, that's like self-confidence issues. They are just like questioning everything uh, about the technology, but they don't question their own judgment. And that's the problem. Yes, you, that you is, ha- you're very true. Very yeah, right. Very you, have, right. you have to always question yourself and question yeah. what you do and question the technology. And uh, and there's so many know, of us who have the God complex, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm a human. This can't replace me. I'm the best <laughs> creature ever created, which is like bullshit. You know, it's, <laughs> that's, stu- that's so stupid to think about. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I, again, I think, I think these people, I kind of, the, the, the problem will happen if like the mass majority of people thought about this technology this way because there's a lot of smart people out there yeah, who will, yeah. who understand the technology you know what's going on mm. and they will actually employ these technologies and at their own will there mm. will maybe not be as pure as most of people so if mm. you're just not question everything if you don't understand the technology yeah. you're just becoming a very easy puppet to be manipulated it's like by social somebody media. Who just like everything, yeah, and yeah, and social media product. is a, yeah, exactly, exactly. Social media is a very good example of how yeah. you can really control like an entire society is using like very simple technologies, and AI is just not any different. It's uh, well, basically, mid, like the, the social media is run by AI. Like AI kind of really dictates what you see, what you like. It's it will actually. Um, um, influence you to buy something or like to think about something. Mm. I, I'm pretty sure that at one point, like um, for some reason I don't know, but I think like Instagram was like uh, trying to like the, the the data set of Instagram is filled with like AI content, right? Like a lot of people yeah, creating yeah. a journey, and yeah. I think it was uh, empowering those contexts. It was trying to. Oh, somebody mm. or maybe yeah, it to, was trying to make this so the algorithm was trying to promote it exactly yeah like i got a huge push out of nowhere when mm. i started ai and i really don't understand that why i can't say mm. I, I i like I, I i'm i'm still trying to figure myself out as an artist i'm trying to understand my work style and i just like got a very uh boost like very strong boost uh to prom- promote my work and i i really don't understand that and it's happening with like some people or like many people so Again, if the AI in the social media, if the models in the social media decided not to prompt, promote my work, probably you and I won't be having that conversation. You would never have seen my work. So we're kind of dictated. We are in this area where the technology is impacting us in ways that we don't understand. Or like we are, mm. we are, we don't really think about it in the way that we really need to. When you when you use mm-hmm. Midjourney, it's a symbiotic relationship because the more you use it, the more the uh, the algorithm learns from you in order to improve and serve you better. But yeah, but you control how much this tool is learning, right? Because it doesn't learn on itself. Sure. Like, yeah, you have to interact with it. Not only that, the developers will have to train it on the data that I'm giving it. Yeah, and so, like you said, the the evolutionary difference that you saw in version four of Mid Journey, 
it was able to handle your prompts a lot better. Um, yeah, because it had better training. It had better it training. Had better training. That and developed... that better training is, yeah. is a is a is a consequence of um, of many creative uh, individuals like you prompts putting in prompts that were not being met uh, sufficiently. Uh-huh. And so the data yeah, set and, and to also be it's, it's part of and, yeah, and also it's part of the intuition of the developers themselves. Right. For example, right. like Midjourney, what really sets Midjourney apart from like Dali two or or Stable Diffusion is that in Midjourney they fine tune their models, they create to create beautiful images. Hmm. So they have it has this human right. touch, yeah. you know, in a way it doesn't yeah. learn on its own. And uh, hmm. if I don't know again, I don't know how or when or if uh, a sentient AI will just come and sit on the driver's seat and dictate, okay, I think that's beautiful. You human are stupid. I'm not mm. going to do that. Mm. And uh, I'm going to do things on my own. Right now, in the journey, the developers are on the driver's seat, not the users, but the developers. Right. right? Mm. They dictate what's beautiful and what not. Right. They are trying, they try to be like very democratic. So there's a human still it. acting as a filter. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, in, in every technology that's working with, even like mm. with, so nothing is really like autonomous, really. Yeah, There's sure, like sure, a filter. Sure. There are boundaries. Yeah, like to break the boundaries. And even I don't know. I'm really thinking about even if the AI became sentient and they try to increase their data set, their data set will still be limited to our data set. They will just have yes. better context. So yeah. they will make more meaningful connections of what is already existed. Right. Not, they won't create some, some stuff on their own unless mm. something else have. I mean, that will be the next evolution is like yeah. to create something out and of that's, something. That's where things would get complicated. Yeah. But again, I, I don't think that we will reach that scenario in our lifetimes. Where, you, where a sentient being can create something out of nothing. I I don't think so. So originality, Maybe. something original. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, again, the term original itself is kind of really deceiving. So what we mean by original or creativity for me, it means like it means to create something new out of the composition of many of many things that already existed. So there is there is still context in it. It's still contextual. Yeah, You're it's still totally contextual. Taking yeah, of influences and uh, from what you see around you. And what yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We are just yeah. I think like yeah. the creative process is just a matter of like combining existing uh, concepts or ideas to mm. to make a new thing. Just like I think like the 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 artist or the arch- or like the creative person is like a chef, right? He mm. has like his own components. But, uh, you know, he just like puts them together in some manner and then he bake it and then you get like your pie. The pie never mm. existed before. There wasn't a pie. But if you break it down, you can really chase everything that happened. The chef just put them together yeah. in, a, in, the, in, in his or her own way. Yeah. And uh, that's creativity. Different permutation combinations of pretty much a, a, fixed, um, a fixed set of ingredients. Yeah, ingredients that wouldn't usually belong yeah. together. And yeah. now you just add, you managed to put them together to make mm. your, your, you know, your, your meal in a way. And uh, yeah, that's creativity. Yeah. And that's for an the AI way to, to think about it. Yeah. So yeah, uh, for the AI to kind of break that, it's, it's now everybody thinking if the AI will reach the level of becoming the chef, right? Without going mm. back to, but again, mm. I, I don't think, I think that the more interesting for me, the more interesting, interesting thing to see is how will be, uh, well, we we will have a sentient being that will co- really come with like something that's that wasn't there, like mm. to make new components that maybe didn't fit on our planet, maybe maybe didn't fit on our universe. But again, it's really hard for us to understand that as human beings. We can't really understand that concept because we are wired for context. We are yeah. built from and context. That, but that that would make the AI far more powerful than us in a certain way. Yeah. To be able that, to I, I, that, I, yeah, I, I think I think at that. It's almost you, godlike. Yeah, exactly. I think at yeah, that's like a godlike uh, being. Again, at that point, probably we wouldn't need to worry because I think we will perish as species, or at least we, oh, we will become like rats or like you know, I don't know, yeah. or, or rabbits. 
just like yeah. you know something that we can experiment be like in expert our supremacy we, will yeah. just die at that point. we won't be at the top of the food chain yep uh yeah. our, there was a really nice podcast that i was hearing in 2019 it was calling the end of the world i don't know if you ever heard it but mm-hmm. uh i think it was like a small series of like maybe 10 episodes and in each episode he was talking about existential risks and mm. what can actually wipe the human race mm. and and you can now he, add ai to that I, he actually he, he had he added ai at that point he added singularity at, to that mm. but again mm. when you hear the episodes there is a lot that's going on that's actually really dangerous to our existence and ai yeah. is just a part of it just so one yeah so yeah i just like i'm it's it's a way to calm myself down like hey you don't need to worry about that there's a lot of things that could go on before the you what know could before go the worse? Of singularity. what could yeah. be worse than ai well a lot yeah, actually uh, yeah exactly a lot so yeah I, I i find solace in that i find like some comfort in knowing that i it's it's way beyond my control and like as human beings we're just here to experience and enjoy the right like was it like whether it's an upside or a downside we're just here to witness life as it happens and it's not be, it's not in our control it's not in my control at least yeah i'm not trying to control it i'm just like you know i'm here for the just experience along for the ride yep <laughs> <laughs> yep Hasan Ragab, it has been a fascinating conversation thank you so much for taking out the time and joining me on the oth podcast thank you thank you Roy, I really enjoyed i'm gonna that. link and i'm gonna link to your instagram page and your website um below the video in the description and uh for all of you watching check out asan ragab's instagram page he's uh, a brilliant amazing creative mind creative talent and i i wish you all the very best for your future hasan thank you roy very much appreciate it thank you <laughs>